is that um, with, further, without, um, um, any further delay, I would like to introduce uh, Carolyn Hasty. Carolyn is a mother and grandmother. Of an older the grandmother, don't be. She's been a decade and midwife for four decades. I can't believe that either. Um, she's had the pleasure of working all models in the of care. Her own family of origin and childbearing history, together with her experience in private practice, has provided the stimulus to explore the field of fetal development and mother fetus interaction. And so today, Karen is going to take us through current understanding about fetal development and the role of the environment in long term health and well being of the developing individual. Karen, Karen is currently teaching midwifery at the University of Southern Cross on the Gold Coast in Australia. Thank you very much, Karen. Over to you. Thanks, Sarah. And welcome, everybody. And it is a cool picture, isn't it? Emma? <laughs> Emma does that it's a cool picture. Um, Peter Simos, who's a medical student and a um, biochemist person, he had that background, and I thought it was just fantastic. And sometimes the um, fetus can feel like it's floating in fluid um, when we're understanding the consciousness of uh, the developing. Being. So the topic is entangled mind and entangled body, and I'll be travelling to the understanding that we can glean from quantum physics um, about fetal development and mother baby attachment and father baby attachment or partner baby attachment. So the aim of this session is really to talk about why sitting and talking and being with the women and their partners and their families and doing those things that midwives do so well about getting to know the women, exploring how they feel, going through, travelling through all that information about their own experience of being mothered, what their mothers are like, their fathers are like, what they think about this person that's coming into their life. Because we know from all those diverse things of science now that how important that is to have that opportunity to sit down to feel relaxed and comfortable. And the last um, couple of presentations have been very interesting, talking about the way this has been corporatized, really. And I think that whole political action around bringing the relationship back into the existing practice is really, really important. And obviously that's more so in the Western world than in some developing countries. But um, that whole relationship-based care is critical for the mother's physiology to work in the best way and then for the, in the, you know, the prenate to actually take what it needs and grow throughout the pregnancy. This is a couple that I had the pleasure of being with at their birth at home. I was actually my big job was with photography because they were so well prepared that they knew exactly what they were doing. We know that the kind of care we give when we can sit and talk and explore ideas and give information and share learning and share emotional stories, uh, it really helps mothers and their partners connect and this whole thing about engaging dads and I know Dan Maddox talking later this evening or later in the morning for others on the other side of the world from me but we know that that connection with their babies is a life-giving force. We know that from Harlow Monkin experiments way back but we also know from the Romanian orphanages that the children who were there that didn't get any physical touch no loving kindness, they died. And that whole thing about loving, tender attention is needed right from the beginning. I just want to briefly run through the Newtonian physics idea, which was, you know, both Newtonian and quantum physics are important because they explain different realities about our physical and energetic universe and world. So I got Newton, you know, the whole apple falls from the tree thing which gave the physics idea. And that matter is solid bodies in empty space. 
The quantum physics tells us that we're not solids, that we're energy particles, and the whole world is made up of energy particles. And these particles group together to make material objects such as people, stones, water. But the key difference between living things and inanimate objects is consciousness. It's a bit like that, isn't it? You know, where is it? Where is consciousness? And they're looking for it in all sorts of places. They're examining the brain and they're running down into the microtubules, trying to see where consciousness resides. But consciousness has been called many things. A spirit, awareness, life force, mindfulness. One of the things we also know is that there's the issue of consciousness. Where is it? Where, does it? where is it? Where is it located? Where do we find it? It's something bigger. Um, bigger than the material world. And then there's the idea of entanglement and non-locality. And a man called Dean Ladin has been doing a lot of work about entanglement. And they know that when particles, and we're all particles, are in connection with each other, they become entangled. And they remain that way no matter how far apart they are. So what, one, what affects one affects the other, which is called non-locality. Einstein actually referred to that capacity as spooky action of the distance. So when talking about Radin and all the work and other people too, but then Radin's probably done the most. Uh, when they put, there's a thing called a Faraday cage, which is totally isolated from any kind of outside influence. And they put a, a neuron in one and a neuron in the other. And what they did to one neuron affected the other neuron in the other Faraday cage, even though there was no possible way that they could have communicated. And they've done that to single cells. They've done it to uh, lots of cells. They've done it to human beings. They had one human being in a Faraday cage in one place and another in another Faraday cage. And when they've done something to one or got them to do a particular activity, their physiology has reacted as if it was happening to them. So these are people who knew each other and um, husbands and wives, partners, um, children and, and parents. So we are very, very interconnected. So quantum physics tells us that living things emit a weak radiation. The MRIs measure this, and nanotechnology um, is coming to the fore with quantum physics and is doing an enormous amount of work in the health field. And what we know is that communication and information exchange occurs constantly. So we really know that um, I keep getting distracted by the chat box. <laughs> I'm looking to see the questions. Um, that communication information exchange, we know that at the point of conception, um, there's, people could liken it to the primordial battle of um, the mother's system either welcoming or rejecting the budding um, blastocyst. So that's the first, the first hurdle, but there's probably further, you know, previous hurdles just in terms of the production of the egg and the sperm, and then how those two um, cells actually negotiate the state to come together. So there's a neuron which is emitting weak radiation constantly. It's a great graphic, that one. And then we come to the idea of epigenetics, which many of you will have heard about already. Um, evolutionary biology uh, has come to understand that our genes and our cells uh, really respond to signals outside the cells and that uh, there's hormonal and energetic messages that reflect the emotional, mental and spiritual experiences. And the scientists who work with epigenetics, which means above the genes, says that environmental signals control the expression of and the activity of genes and that regulatory proteins um, they're kind of reading the environment and then tweaking the genetic code to up to 2,000 variations, and I've heard more. We 
then they were mapping the human genome. They really thought they'd find, you know, a hundred thousand or more genes, and they were quite sobered to discover that they um, only found about twenty six thousand, and we've only got two percent different from a banana, and two percent different from a um, chimpanzee and other creatures too. And what they've realised is that what we used to call junk DNA, and you know, I think it makes me chuckle because nature don't do junk. I think we have to really understand that. The, the microRNA, the so-called junk DNA, has been dismissed for forever. And suddenly they go, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, this stuff seems to be important. And the, um, the, the what we know is that these regulatory proteins are actually creating how those genes are going to be expressed. And this has huge implications for preconceptual care. And I think midwifery really needs to look at taking on preconceptual care in a big way because we know that parents are actually genetic archetypes, archetypes of their children, that what they're doing for the, some people say six months, some people say a year, before the actual gamete is expressed, um, actually influences which genes are going to be expressed in the sperm and in the egg. So what, what, instead of genes, they used to say that genes were actually, you know, the source of life and the important bit and everything came from that. But they're actually just storage boxes. They're just like any blueprint. They're like a blueprint for a uh, house, for example. An architect can make a blueprint, but the builder takes that and the builder interprets that blueprint. And I'd like you to think about um, a play, for example, Shakespeare. And um, think about Romeo and Juliet, for example. We've had two films of Romeo and Juliet, and how different are they? I don't know if you get the, trans, you know, the traditional Shakespearean actors doing the traditional Shakespearean play. It's a very different thing from, I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio, wasn't it, with Romeo? How different is it? And that's exactly what's happening with our genes, um, even now, but particularly in the genesis of the gamete, um, both sperm and the egg. And then again, as this little individual, this little um, <laughs> beginning human being, this little ball of cells, is actually expressing itself. Um, so we know that information is transmitted generationally through DNA and environmentally cues changes. So Bruce Lipton is a really good person to read. His book, The Biology of Belief, is wonderful. And he's actually done a couple of TED Talks. You can find him on, on YouTube. He is absolutely wonderful. He wrote a book, his book, The Biology of Belief, really explains it quite simply about parents with genetic archetypes. So these uh, physical memories are actually encoded in the genetic structure and carried through. It's such a fascinating, I can see people are saying this is really interesting. Um, yeah, absolutely fascinating and fun. So we know that this material is, is uh, what comes out and expresses itself because we know that as those, um, as the ovum and the egg and the uh, sperm are developing, they're split and then the chromosomes, you know, they've got 26 in each cell and they've got on, on each of the chromosomes they've got what they call allelate, so they've got uh, the characteristic, each characteristic they've got like two keys, so which one gets expressed and if it gets expressed at all depends on these um, beliefs and habits and behaviours and social influences that uh, this, and you can see how intelligent nature is because what nature is doing it is helping create the person that can live in the environment that it's been born into. So this happens right throughout this developmental process. So here's a few random stern hanging around, and they're a bit aimless. And here they've, just, they've had that um, female attractor of the ovum has been released and they're off to do their business. This, these photos are from um, Leonard Nelson's book. Leonard Milton uh, did that fiber optic photography in the uterus, which was extraordinary of the developing prenate. Extraordinary work, and also sperms and eggs. And the 
the classic line has been that the egg is like this passive waiting cell, waiting for the sperm to surround it and release their, I love the word pyrolizonidase, that, that um, secretion the sperm has that breaks down the vitelline membrane around the egg. The reality is the, the, the egg is actually moving with the cilia, the cilia and the waves in that whole um, end of the fallopian tube, the fimbria, there's a whole lot of wave movement going on. So the, the egg is moving and there seems to be, yes, they need all those sperm, yes, they need that hyaluronidase to break down that vitelline membrane, but the egg is actually receptive to the sperm it wants. It actually um, creates a sort of sinkhole where the sperm can go into and cut out any others that actually chooses the sperm. So by the end of the first month, um, we've, we've jumped off a, a cycle a bit here. There's so much in this and it's just wonderful. And I'd recommend to you, if you're really interested, uh, Alexander Tassaris' book. Um, I think it's called Conception, but I can check that for you. So we know that by the end of the first month that the, um, all these structures are in place and that that primitive vascular system is starting to thread its way through and the heartbeat, uh, the tube, the actual tube is starting to uh, beat rhythmically. Which is just phenomenal, isn't it, when you think about it? And at 44 days, 44 days, that 99% of the embryo's muscles complete with nerves and vascular supply are present. It's all there in that primordial um, setup. So here's a five weeker, and you can see that um, spinal cord is starting to starting to fuse. The little trippers are there, the little feet are there, and when people were looking at the embryo and they're trying to work out why do the limbs move? But what we know is that form follows function so that the whole experience of growth and development is experience dependent so that it depends on experience but it's also experience expectant so that it expects certain movements, food and you know nutrition. Nutrition is so crucial and that's another big area for midwives to really get a good ground in. I know that Student advisors are really learning a lot about nutrition now. They're doing subjects. I know our students have a whole unit on food and nutrition um, because we see that is so vitally important for midwives to know how to support women and their partners to produce mm, optimal physiology and optimal um, gamete production and then obviously to really provide that nutritional substances that help that individual grow in the best way it can. So week seven, a lot more definition. So what they discovered was that the, the arms and legs need to be able to move so that they can grow. So that it expects the, the genetic blueprint expects the movement and it depends upon the movement to be able to express the next level of development. I'll just um, put this slide up for the critical period um, because this is really important for us to think about. And one of the biggest bugbears I think we have in our modern maternity units is that often women won't see a midwife until she's over 20 weeks. Well, if it makes any sense, the horse has already bolted. And I know for some cultures that doesn't make sense. But it, what I'm saying is that if you've got a horse and you have the gate open, once the, once the horse is out, there's no point cutting the gate. And it's like that with this whole prenatal growth and development, that seeing people at 20 weeks, there's a lot that's gone on. The foundations are there. The whole process is well and truly got a template happening. We need to be involved preconceptually and really early in pregnancy to be with women and their partners and really help them negotiate these times. And you can see the weeks, um, third week for the brain, the heart, around four weeks. We know that um, neurons start getting um, born out of that neural tube 
Trinidad post-conception, four weeks post-conception. So all these neurons are spilling out, well, shooting out, actually. So it looks like a firecracker, I reckon, because they're going it. I don't know who counted them, but they say there's 250,000 per minute being born and travelling to the different places in that little developing embryo's body. So there's the cerebral brain, there's the heart brain, and there's the gut brain, and then there's all those nodes that are um, ganglions in Western medicine. So you're looking at the lower limbs when they're formed, the ears, the eyes, the palate, the teeth, the external genitalia. So there's major abnormalities in this pink region and then the functional and minor abnormalities in the um, in that more orange section. So the teratogens, what are teratogens? Well, the teratogens are mixed as long as you are with teratogens, but I'd really like you to consider the, the two major ones um, from my point of view, and this is my complete bias, I'm owning this, uh, is the maternal state of um, happiness about the pregnancy and nutritional load. Uh, two, I can't help but feel, and this is a total hallucination and I'm making it up, that those two things are protective for all the other things that go on. Um, we really need to think about what's going to protect, like we've got people in war-torn areas um, and there's so much we know about maternal stress and how that really um, is very, very dangerous for babies. Um, I know um, for myself, my own experience, and I've written about it in um, our book, The Territory and the Literary Guardian Tip, I did a telecaster there about the emotional and spiritual territory of the growing individual. Um, but I think it's really important and we need to explore this a lot more. There's also the question saying on there, which is fantastic. <laughs> I just want you to look at the, in, the inner cell mass, so there's a bit of a revision for you, the ectoderm, the mesoderm and the endoderm. And the part before that gastrulation is probably one of the critical points when the cells are rearranging themselves. And I'm like, oh, what an intelligent process. And I want you to look at an uh, ectoderm, and you'll see that the skin and the nervous system come from that um, that area. So the skin is actually a nervous system. It's as much a nervous system as the cerebral brain because of all the receptors um, in that area. So it's a big sensory brain. And I just think that really points to why um, skin to skin experience at birth is so critical for the mother and for the newborn. Because what it's doing is it's really um, boosting up the baby in terms of love and connectedness and physiology, absolutely setting in the right pattern for the start in life. So that's where they get their sense of safety from, their sense of love, their sense of trust by how they're treated as the, the reticular activated system uh, is set at this time at birth. So there's a man called um, James Prescott who's done a lot of work with, um, it's quite fascinating, you can Google him. He wrote about the origin of love and violence and he said that the death out of love is being held, being rocked and uh, being touched and the smells that go with that experience when we land um, on the outside of our mothers. And if we land on her skin and we're held and the warmth, all those sensory experiences are actually setting that particular activation system into a, a place of feeling safe in the world. When they go on to the reflux folly and have all sorts of things done to them, then they're actually not, they're, they're in a, a state of the world's unsafe. Now, we know that putting a, um, a baby and a, and a mother in the bath and getting them skin to skin in the bath, even if they've had to go to NICU or any of those sort of things, reboots the baby. So use a computer term. <laughs> it actually helps that whole process get going. And Demetra has just said their physiological birth and breastfeeding, absolutely. And Maxine talking about physical contact is a priming activity for 
for reception of love, absolutely, and for giving it, because that original relationship is what sets the stage for the future relationship. And breastfeeding, of course, that when a baby's got um, skin to skin experience and access to the breast, it will get there. And so letting a newborn find its own way is so important. Spirit it's mother's help because the mother giggles it and moves it. But it's them doing it together without our interference and the baby will find its way using those markers. You know, you've got your lovely linear negra, which is dark coloured for the child to follow because they can see black, white and red. So I think it's really interesting the way the linear negra um, and the nipples change colour during pregnancy, which seem to be the markers um, of the of, for the baby to actually find its way. So neurogenesis, we talked a little bit about that. There's apparently about 100 billion neurons. It depends what book you read. I can't find any definitive thing, but this book by Harding and Bocking, which <laughs> it, it makes me chuckle actually because um, every second paragraph we just know we don't quite know how this happened. There's still so much we don't know about human development. There's so much we don't know about the way our cells work. There's so much we don't know about how um, people are protected in difficult times. But I think that's what we really need to look at. How do we protect this system so that it can grow and develop in the best way? So there's 100 million neurons in the enteric nervous system in the gut, and there's 100 million neurons in the cardiac nervous system. Now, this is important because there's a, a friendly brain cell. Hello. I say this is gorgeous. I want you to look at these. I want, I want you to look at these um, three, three uh, images of the brain. Now, this one's a two-month two month embryo, eight weeks. And here we've got the spinal cord, the cerebellum developing, and the diencephalon. This is where all the emotional brain is. And then the telencephalon grows over and becomes, you know, part of that cortex, and then the prefrontal cortex wires in later on. But this is the emotional brain. This is all the structures that manage the heart rate, um, little breathing movements, um, all those physiological processes. And the emotional brain, exactly. So that what's happening in pregnancy is that the growing fetus is growing its capacity to deal with life and stress and everything that's going on by working with the environment. So it's being built to come out into the environment it's living in. So when there's really high stress, um, a lot of uh, aggro, then the hind brain gets really developed and it's at the expense of the telencephalon and the prefrontal cortex that is smaller in babies who grow in hostile environments. This emotional brain, we know that um, part of all these structures here is the, what's called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access or the stress response. And when there's a lot of stress, then these are upregulated. Uh, they're triggered much faster, there's less cortisol around, and um, the child has got a flat affect a lot of the time, or becomes hyper-distressed very quickly. That can be changed over time, but it's much harder to do it once the infant's born and growing than it is to actually intervene in pregnancy and help that woman learn self-management techniques or get out of a dangerous situation or whatever's going on for her that's creating this constant threat. We know that um, following 9-11 and also the 20 years war in Lebanon, whenever there was a bombing um, experience and wondering what's going on in Syria now, apart from all those absolute genocide of the Sunnis, um, we know that the rate of miscarriage, uh, spontaneous abortion, rises dramatically as does stillbirth. And think about that from an evolutionary biology point of view. The mother, the mother has to be um, nature's, nature's preference to keep because you can always have another baby, but you can't always have another mother. 
So um, it's really, really important that we understand this so that we can work with women in whatever their context is to help them. Now I found it's quite interesting when you're working with women who are in distressed circumstances that they really get this. And whether it's drug taking or whether it's stressful situations, they really understand and they find this fascinating and they will do everything in their power to change their circumstances. These, these two brains here um, are from dead babies and the one on the, is it on your left, uh, is the normal brain and the one on your right is the fetal, fetal al alcohol syndrome um, growth fetal ingestion baby and it's a, it's a gross example of what can happen to brain development um, when there's a terrible teratism around but we don't really see a lot of the other ones that happen to overheating um, and poor nutrition. The other thing I was going to mention, I think we're going to get to people programming in a minute. This is ongoing. Hmm. Three intersecting worlds, so the spiritual, the chemical and the sensual, and they're the ones that we're working with. So these two biobehavioural domains, I, I think I might have missed that out um, on this slide, but I just want to mention the whole thing about fetal programming um, and the Dutch hunger winter, which really gave us um, the two things. Dr. Barker, uh, Dr. Barker is an epidemiologist in Bristol in the UK, and he had access to an enormous amount of data for people's long-term health and wellness, and what he recognised with vast numbers was that people who were born small and um, had small percentage, wonderful midwifery records, they actually um, they actually had higher rates of cardiac disease, um, high blood pressure, diabetes in later life. So he had a hypothesis that um, that children that developing embryos, developing fetuses actually are affected by the environment and that they're programmed for their long-term health and wellness. So there's the, um, the genomic imprinting happens early. And what, what happens is that, that, for example, with the kidneys, when a, with a growing fetus, if there's not enough food or there's a lot of stress or there's a combination of all those things or there's, you know, various there's things missing that will have head sparing, and we all know about head sparing growth restriction. But the kidneys are the things that they all, the fetus won't bother developing because the excretion is taken care of by the cord so that the kidneys aren't, used, aren't needed in, um, in pregnancy. So that has huge implications for people. We know our own indigenous brothers and sisters have a huge issue with um, kidney disease lots and lots of people on dialysis. So this whole idea of early nutrition, early stress reduction is so important for understanding this genomic imprinting and the fetal programming. Back to the Dutch hunger winter, what they discovered was, because they had fabulous um, records from Holland, was that Depending, there was a period where there was, a, where there was great deprivation. People were literally starving. Now, if they were starving in early pregnancy, those children turned on a gene they called the thrifty gene, which actually really conserved the food and made it available in a very, um, a very time limited way. It was really, really very uh, conservative. But the minute those children got adequate food, they became obese, and they were much, like, much more likely to be obese in later age when they're older. When they had that deprivation in later pregnancy, they were much leaner and their cells stayed the same. They didn't have the same thing, but they may they would have trouble also with high blood pressure and um, diabetes later in life. So depending on what the Barker hypothesis, that's right, Barker theory now, because everyone's um, now agreed that it's more than a hypothesis is actually true and the and the plethora of, of studies that have been done on this is extraordinary. 
if I look up the Dutch hunger winter and you'll see the the way that people have interpreted data and then they'll understand that it's really powerful when that deprivation happens, when those um, when those emotional times happen. So we know that chronic stress, a little bit of stress is good because it helps that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis um, grow and develop in a flexible, robust way so it gets tested. But chronic, long-term stress, no good, and really profound acute stress, like with bombing or something really distressing, is also very, very um, damaging. So the two biobehavioral domains mediated by that autonomic nervous system, the love pathway, the parasympathetic, uh, via the vagal nerve, so it goes from the gut to the heart and into the emotional brain. And the fear one, the sympathetic, is up the spinal cord and the various hormones. So we know that the hormones are parasympathetic, um, there's um, dopamine, oxytocin, relaxin, endorphins and serotonin. And one of the things we know is that most of the serotonin and most of the immune system is actually created in the gut. The gut brain takes care of that. And the fear is, so you call it doors, the doors to happiness, D-O-R-E-S, are the initials of the hormones in the parasympathetic nervous system. And when we're in the parasympathetic, that's when we tend and befriend and we're queasy and happy and our babies grow well. The fear, fear is only supposed to be around when there's you know, some kind of beast about to eat you or some real threat to life and limb, but now we're, we're stressed driving on the freeway. So we're all upregulated um, with our fear cascade happening, the sympathetic being uh, stimulated. So um, people talking about traumatic birth, which affects their psyche, absolutely. Um, Rihanna's talking about that, that rebirthing and also those psychodynamic processes of uh, going back in. Every, everything is um, recorded in the, cell, in the cells of the growing individual. That's called implicit memory. People used to think that uh, newborns couldn't feel pain, didn't remember things and so on, but that's not true. It's all there. And um, we're talking about Michelle O'Don from his work, which is absolutely wonderful, and the link to autism. There's also a link with the use of exogenous oxytocin to autistic spectrum disorder. And that's something I think we've really got to look at. So these four major, I better hurry up, I could talk all day, that was stuff, it's just so fascinating. <laughs> um, four major systems of adaption. Um, self-regulation and communication, they use chemical messages. That's Candace Kurt's work. She discovered the receptor site for endorphins, and I would really encourage you to read her book, which is called Molecules of Emotion. It's absolutely wonderful. So these systems are these four systems, and these, these chemicals can actually change faces. Um, a cytokine can become a hormone, and a hormone can become a neurotransmitter, and then they can turn around in neuropeptides. So they can shape shift intelligent little beings they are. And so their neurotransmitters are used by the autonomic nervous system at the nerve synapses. So this whole thing about optimal performance and activity, so you need a little bit of it to get going and do, you know, when you're going to do something important and get a little surge of that sympathetic system. And then tap creativity, relaxation and healing and growing of um, prenatal. So hormones are the endocrine system, so it regulates all those basic processes, and it's also involved in emotions, memory, learning, and behaviour. And I want you to think about these things in relation to that developing prenatal and what it means for each individual. So cytokines, the immune system, and what one of the master hormones is CRH. Um, cryotonic um, releasing hormone. That is that seems to be the hormone that's involved in everything, including implantation and receptivity of the mother mother's cells to the developing um, blastocyst. So it's also you know does all this as well as it's involved in psychological mood and motivation. So you can see how if people are down, then their immune system is down. And neuropeptides, so they modulate that um, 
central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And all these neural communication in these uh, various states have been. Um, Rossi is the person to read for that. Um, he's done some wonderful work with, um, on all these uh, neural communications and genetic expression. Uh, let it, uh, yeah, just um, want to in and tell you you've got um, five minutes until the absolute close of your session. We better hurry up there, haven't we? <laughs> so back to those people programming. We're talking. We talked about that. Are these three mechanisms for fetal integration of this environmental information, and that excessive maternal stress can have organisational effects on the fetus, long-term consequences. So one of the things we know from the research is that these stress hormones, cortisol, is much lower when women have a perception of control, and they're much higher when they feel like they're being done to or they feel out of control, which has organisational effects on the fetus and the mother and her processes. So that that is why information sharing, discussing, talking, being with, and letting the women drive the bus, if you like, um, really help those stress hormones stay in a reasonable level. So the prenatal environment, um, Joe Johnson's talking about how people want to read studies. There's plenty of studies on these um, things. They're all in the, the literature. So the prenatal environment is everything to do with the mother and her environment. So the social, economic, cultural status, the quality of the relationship, the day to day activities, what she eats and drinks, and so on. And this is a great poster from ANTA, which is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, organisation that's working towards a better deal for our Indigenous people, and that's exactly right. Our physiology is constantly leading the environment, and when it's off, it responds way below our conscious awareness. So here's a scan photo of a 17-week uh, fetus smiling. So the fetus is having an emotional experience that can do all these things way before birth. And these are good, and, and we know that babies who have, for example, uh, of tachyosophageal fistulas uh, don't pick up because they don't have that pressure and they don't swallow in utero, so they don't learn how to swallow. One of, our, one of my friends um, had a child with um, a top, and it was quite interesting, apart from how horrible it was, to see how that child had to learn to swallow. 16 weeker, and this is how we want babies to be with their mothers. And it was funny, when I first really started getting into all of this, I really thought that it would keep parents together, that when you had all these bonding experiences, it would keep parents together. Well, that didn't happen, actually. But what did happen was that our fathers would stay connected with their infants, which we all know is profoundly important. And that the um, caregiver, the, the primary caregiver and that infant, the brain is growing and developing according to the quality of the relationship that's developed prenatally and during birth and postnatally. And so the end of the story is that every woman, the way we work with women and their partners, that every woman should feel better about themselves when they leave us than when they come into us. That's it. I finished. Sorry. The way in time, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Oh, by the skin of your teeth, darling. Um, I, I have to say, I find this presentation a little scary, to be honest, because when I think about my kids who are now beautiful young adults of 23, 24, 25, and how oblivious I was when I was pregnant, and even before I was pregnant, about you know, the impact of things I did and ate and where I was and everything on the growth of my children, um, it's a bit scary, really, but... Um, I guess that science will continue to inform us about these things. And um, look, we have got like half a second for a quick one, very, very quick question. If anyone wants to, um, just one quick question either in um, in the in the text box. Um, can I just say the next after that? Oh, someone's after that. Ola has after that. Alexander Tsaris, T S A I R I S. He's actually done a TED. Fantastic baller. So have a look at his TED talk. It's really good. He, he does a lot of um, simulation and graphics. He's a he's a master at that. That's what his his role is. 
And so this is us about my references. So I'll credit them if I can email that to Sarah and she can put it up. All right, well, look, Carolyn, I think we'll call it a day. Thank you very, very much. Um, and certainly, um, I've been looking forward to your presentation. I think that it's something that is, uh, I haven't really put a lot of thought to, um, other than the, the reading of stuff that you, you, you think about as a midwife. So I really appreciate you opening up our minds to um, things to go on. And, and like with so many of the other publishers, probably, um, for me, raise more questions than answers. So it's good to leave you the confidence to continue to um, investigate. So thank you, Carolyn, and um, especially if you um, helped us out literally at the last minute. So much um, grateful thanks to you. Um, so and thank you, everybody, for attending and your wonderful comments um, as we've gone along. I'm actually going to say um, good night to you now. I'm um, going off and having my Sunday tea, and um, and I will be joining the presentation. Um, joining again tomorrow morning, and um, so I'm going to be leaving you in the hands um, of um, I think it's quite, um, Deborah Davis, who's going to be um, facilitating your very next session. So we've got 10 minutes now, where we'll be set up for the next speaker.